That's true. Naked Palpatine. Um. <laughs> oh, oh, you pick that one. Fresh out of the clone tank, nude Palpatine is my That's well, the first thing I think of when you say Dark Empire Palpatine. go where no one has gone before. Welcome back to Star Trek Enterprise. Wearing my suit again. I've decided that for this series, I'm not very good with TV show reviews, especially if whole seasons worth. So I'm just going to talk about the episodes I liked from season two of Star Trek Enterprise and gave you some highlights of that. And then of course, um, we'll do that for season three, season four. And depending on what show I'm talking about, whether it be TNG or DS9, depending on the episode, I might take longer to talk about it. How I might dedicate an entire episode to it if, I, if it warrants it. But we'll see when we get there how I feel about those individually. But, overall, um, season two is more of a mixed bag. I think I like season one a bit more than season two of Star Trek Enterprise. But, um, Shockwave part one and two, um, basically, Shockwave part one is in the end of season one, but I decided to talk about it here because they go to meet this this people right typical star trek um but then they end up blowing up the whole colony now is it their fault or is it not turns out it's not their fault turns out it's a sulabon um but it is interesting that what would this show be like without the time travel because, you know, people talk about things not lining up with the original series and stuff. But time travel's been going on since the original series. So what if all this time travel from TOS to TNG to DS9, probably in Voyager, I forget. Um, but all that has already altered the timeline, right? So then Star Trek Enterprise, we get more. So we don't actually know what the original timeline is like, but this is a whole thing of them having to figure out what's going on with that and fixing it and learning that it's not their fault but first they have to deal with a lot of grief which is uh, it was acted really well and again if you want further um in-depth analysis of episode by episode i will leave a link in the description to lore runner's videos on the topic as he did every single episode one by one and talked about them all um also, this just further confirms to me that Archer has to be future villain. Um, because there's a part where the Sulon need to talk to future guy, and future guy just won't respond. Why is that? Well, because Archer was teleported to the future. Except that there is no future, because since he was in the past, the future is ruined. Blah, 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 blah. But it's just funny, because future guy just is nowhere to be found when Archer is nowhere to be found. And will this storyline ever be picked up anywhere? In the show, no. I don't know if any of the books discuss that, but as far as the show is concerned, it won't ever address it. So that's great. Um, but yeah, those the, I really enjoyed the two-parter. I think it was a really, really good start to the season. Episode 2, we have Carbon Creek, which is a possible true story of the first time Vulcans interacted with humans, told by T'Pol. And it was actually really good. I really enjoyed that episode. I think it was a really uh, decent little story, and I enjoyed it quite a bit. Episode 3, Minefield. So, um, the Enterprise hits a minefield. Uh, one of them is on the hull of the ship, and Reed has to get it out. But then Reed gets impaled, and it's kind of like this character-building piece for um, Archer and Reed to just kind of get to know each other a little bit better while they disarm this bomb. But other thing is the most important thing here is the Romulans. It's the first case of 
really dealing with them. And it's a thing of, we know that there's an Earth Romulan war, so this is kind of like the start to that uh, sort of thing. Um, episode 4, I don't have too much to comment on. Neither was episode 5, other than the fact that it's about the dog possibly dying, and we dedicated a whole episode to that, when the dog shouldn't have been on the ship in the first place. But there you go. Marauders, episode 6. Bully Klingons. It's... Boring. Episode 7, the 7th, is a very strong episode for T'Pol's character for T'Pol's characterization um you know she gets sent to capture this dude from her past and it's just a very good character building episode for her the main plot is kind of eh, but the character work with her is great um I have nothing to say about episode 8 to 13 nothing of substance anyway that Lore Runner can't better explain to you, so go watch his reviews. Um, 14 Stigma is a great episode. A lot of fun with Stigma. Um, <laughs> the, the side plot with um, Phlox's wife and Tucker, I thought, was actually pretty funny. Especially just because of the alien nature of Phlox not giving a damn. Because he's like, you're lost. You know, like, that was, that was good. Uh, and along with the main plot of the episode um, being a whole... Bunch of good. I, I mainly want to skip to the most important and my favorite episode of the entire season, which is episode 15. Ceasefire. This, 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 this is everything the show should have been. Right here. Episode 15, Ceasefire, is one of, it has to be one of my top ten favorite episodes of Star, Star Trek. Enterprise, at least. Um, if not the best. You know, this has the, um, the Andorians again. We have the Vulcans and Shron, Jeffrey Combs again, and he wants Archer because he knows he can trust Archer. And so there's political intrigue with trans whole faction not agreeing with him. And you also have the Vulcans who don't necessarily want to reach a compromise with the Andorians. And the fact of the matter is, is that here we actually get to see Archer kind of mend some bridges here. They have not actually fully discussed anything yet. They've just decided they will discuss terms. And all they have right now is a ceasefire. But this is an integral link to showing the eventual foundation of the Federation. And this is one of the big first major steps of that. And I really can't give too many faults to the episode. I think it's, it's pretty solid with little to no error. Um, I really enjoyed it. And uh, it's it's vital to the future of the franchise and to the future of this show. So I'll leave that there. Um, episode 16 was very horror-esque. Um, they get this futuristic thing by accident. And the Sulebaum want it. And the Tholians want it. And the Tholians we don't actually get to see, we just hear them. And even then it's through this automated like robot voice. It's very tense, very atmospheric. And what I like is that the Enterprise flat out loses. Just flat out does not succeed. But, but, um, the whoever are from the future, they, they, they take all the stuff back. So nothing actually changes. But it was a very intense episode. It was rather, rather good. I have nothing to say for 1718. Sorry. Um, but episode 19, Judgment, is a Klingon-centric episode, and I loved it. And I imagine my friend Marcel, the revanchist on YouTube, he does short stories of um, the Expanded Universe and these, like, podcast form things. And is also doing super literary encounters of the recently released uh, Star Wars Expanded Universe book, Supernatural Encounters. She should check it out. Anyway, but this is basically a, a court drama but from Klingons. And we also get to just see a lot more of Klingon society here. And Lore Runner also talked about this. I don't, I don't want to feel like a copycat or anything, but, you know, I thought about this before I watched his rumination on it. But yeah, this is, you know, kind of shows the beginning of the decline for them, right? Because by TNG and, and DS9, they, they are on like a decline in society. 
But, you know, you think of Klingons, you just think of the warrior race, right? It's the same thing with the Vong and in, in New Jedi Order or Wookiees, right? But, but there are other things than just warriors in the Klingon society. We have lawyers, doctors, physicians, engineers. You just don't get to see that, right? Because the whole society is focused on honor and that's all you really get to see is the warrior cast because that's like what's cool right now. Um, but Archer convinces the old, uh, I didn't write down the name, the old Klingon that's being his advocate to, to, to make a plea for why he needs to you know, be able to speak his case, you know, and, and it was just a really good episode. It was well acted and everything, and I love Klingons, and I love getting to see this, and it was, it was, it was, it, it was nice to see a different side to them, you know, being, talking about, like, you know, Klingons live longer than humans, but still, it was the idea of, within this guy's lifetime, which is maybe 100 to 200 years, that Klingons were advancing, you know, they were making technological strides, they were evolving medicine and all that but the problem is the culture the society has become so focused on warrior honor and fighting battles but not actually being honorable that everything becomes kind of stagnant you know and M rome didn't fall in the day right so they will continue to exist for the for the next 400 years or whatever but eventually they will be on a decline they don't I mean, their technology progresses a little bit, but if you notice, they don't change that much. They're kind of just stuck. You know? So, I thought this episode was phenomenal. It was, it was another... It's another must-watch of Season 2. Episode 23. Regeneration. This was a perfect... Perfect, 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 perfect perfect horror story and actually lines up pretty well with everything i mean you can make some minor nitpicks here and there but on the whole there's no major 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 plot hole they actually did a good job of making this work within the context of the time and place that this takes place in um so the borg you know we get we get the borg in this uh, story which is very cool because the borg are one of the best villains that star trek ever came up with but again they're very they're not the Borg from TNG. They are a much watered-down version of that, and yet it's terrifying because they still, our heroes barely make it out of the situation. Right? And again, I feel like I'm just ripping off Lore Runner. I'm not trying to. Lore Runner has discussed this as well. Go watch his videos. He's way more attending than I am, way smarter than I am. But the point still stands that they're not at peak efficiency right now, and our heroes still barely make it out of there. And it's just great. You couldn't do this episode too many times because it, it, it wouldn't work. But doing this once was all we needed and it was fantastic. And it does work. And then we also get continuity ties. You know, mentioning Zephyrin Cochran, First Contact, when the Borg were a big part of that movie and everything. And it, it just kind of it just fits. You know, like there's little hitches and everything that you could kind of peel, peel apart. But if you're looking at it on a broad sense, it fits relatively well, surprisingly. And... Lore Runner's talking about in his fiction. This is why Star Trek has always been harder for me to appreciate, though I think I like it more than Star Wars. But for him, it doesn't make sense. That's like his main goal. Lore Runner, not the YouTuber, on does does he like something? For me, it's does it fit within continuity? You know, I like things fitting, making sense in terms of story connections and everything. I like making something silly work in universe, like. For example, in the Star Wars universe, there was an old series called Jedi Prince, where there was a grandson of Palpatine and a lot of other weird stuff like the Prophets of the Dark Side, which was just silly. And then later on, you'd have retcons like Lord Shadow Spawn, who actually could see visions into the future. So he used to be with the organization of the Prophets of the Dark Side. And while Black Hole was a part of that, Lord Shadow Spawn regards was a part of that organization, they prophesized true things. But then he eventually bailed. So in Jedi Prince, they don't have that guy. So now they're just kind of making stuff up, right? Obviously in the series, it's meant to be just them making predictions and stuff. But the retcon now is that, oh, they were, they were literally just making stuff up. But people gave them legitimacy because they had seen them be accurate in the past. So this is stuff like that. 
So I love when continuity does that, when continuity makes everything just fit in a neat little glove. You know, I love that. I love continuity. I love stringing things together. I love making everything fit and be one cohesive whole, which is a bit hard with Star Trek because they don't really care about that sort of thing. But that being said, this is one of those things where I think it does fit relatively well with everything else. Um, another good time I can think of that is when in season four we'll get the um, the smooth heads of the Klingons explaining TOS Klingons. Again, is it necessary? No, but I love stuff like that. I love stuff like that. I appreciate it immensely. Because yeah, you don't have to do that. But by doing that, you've explained something. You know, because obviously people will just roll their heads and go, well, that was TOS, that was old, you know. But it, it, it's the extra mile to make it all fit seamlessly. So all that to say, I think that the Borg being here makes perfect enough sense for this story. I don't think anything was super contrived. Phlox does cure himself of the disease of turning into a Borg. But to be fair, he caught it fairly early on and he fixed it. And it wasn't like this thing where you could just do this. Like he could just make a cure to becoming a Borg if he wanted to. So it is a little weird, but I'm willing to accept it. Um, episode 24 is mostly a flashback episode. And I, and I really enjoyed it. It was a Archer and this guy we never met, but we got to learn about you know, and how they got past the Warp 2 barrier. You know, and how Archer became the captain. And I think it worked out really good. It was a, it was a good two-parter. Or, or a good episode flashback sort of story. And then the only other thing I want to talk about, because I don't want to talk about episode 25, um, is The Expanse. This is basically a pilot to season three. Um, the Zindi attack Earth and lore runners discussed at nauseum why that kind of is stupid, and it kind of is. That being said, it was still a cool little display, um, and it set the stakes, set the tension. I'm willing to suspend my disbelief of why they would do something like that to just kind of appreciate what we're being presented. Um, going to another region of space that no one's really explored, not even the Vulcans. It's very dangerous. We don't know if they're going to make it back, but they got They have ten months from Future Guy. Hope you like Future Guy. It's the last time you're ever going to see him, and you know, stop the Zindi, this new race, or races, from uh, destroying humanity, because they got a tip from the future that humanity would kill them. So it's kind of set up for season three. And it was a really good. I really enjoyed it as a finale, and excited to talk to you about what season three has in store. But that's pretty much it. Um, hope you enjoyed my discussion. I know it's kind of rambly. I know it's kind of out there. I'm not exactly lore on a status of being able to shoot my brain juices and explain all the amazing things that go on in my brain because I'm not lore runner. But I am a big admirer my, I'm a big admirer of his. Love his videos immensely. But I wanted to talk about Trek because I love Trek just as much as the next guy. I love Star Wars. I love Star Trek. I love Dune. I love a lot of things. But I wanted to discuss Star Trek with you because I'm rewatching it. So yeah, that's pretty much it. I expect I'll have more things to say as we head into season three, because season three and four are genuinely really good. Whereas seasons one and two, you have to find the diamonds in the rough. And there were some diamonds in here. You know, like I said with the Klingon episode, or the episode with the Borg, you know. There are, and Cease and Ceasefire, really good. Those are solid, solid, solid Trek episodes. You just have to drudge through the mud to get to those really good ones. So, overall, season two mixed on. Season one, I think I was a little, no, pretty much I'm equally mixed on both those seasons, but moving forward, it's pretty much positive from here on out. So I hope you stick with me as we get through season three and four of Star Trek and I discuss it with you, and then for the first time ever, I will watch Discovery and Strange New Worlds. We'll see how that goes. Anyway, until then. Live long and prosper. See you next time.